Hello Year 11s, so today we're going to be revising AQA GCSE English Language Paper 1 and the materials that we're going to be using for this video are based on their sample paper 1 which is the extract from the Daphne du Maurier novel Jamaica Inn. So what you might want to do right about now is to click on the link in the description and print yourself off a copy of the paper um, so that you can do the tasks as we go. If you don't want to do that, um, you can watch through the video and do all the tasks at the end. Um, so in this video, we're going to be focusing on questions one, two and three. And we'll have a look at question four in a separate video. So um, first of all, let's do some revision of exam technique. So looking at the front of the paper, um, the time allowed for this exam is one hour and 45 minutes. And as always, I suggest that you give yourself five, um, that you give yourself 15 minutes to read through the source. And inside that 15 minutes is included time that you will need to annotate for each question, time to read through the five questions and time to reread. So you're not going to use that 15 minutes all at once. The 15 minutes will be chunked down. So it'll probably take you about three or four minutes to read the source the first time. If you didn't take it all in, you'll probably want to re read through it again quickly. So that's your first five or six minutes gone. And that gives you about seven minutes to go back and reread it. Now, um, the time that you should take actually writing your answer to each question. I always say one minute per mark because that's really, really easy for you to remember. So if it's an eight mark question, you should spend about eight minutes writing your answer to it, which is gonna be obviously a lot shorter than your 20 mark question. So make sure that you're managing your time really, really carefully. So that's my first tip, if you have a look at kind of tells you all this at the bottom of the paper, 15 minutes to read through the source and the five questions. Make sure you leave time to check your answers. If you do a minute per mark, that should leave you five minutes of checking time on section A and five minutes of checking time on section B. I put buffer time as well. So if you do run over on any of your questions, you know you've got a five minute buffer. So let's see what um, looking at the source is going to be like. So I'll read it to you. I'll read it quite nice and quickly for you. Don't forget to read the blurb at the top. This extract is from the opening of novel by Daphne du Maurier. Although it's written in 1936, it's set in the past. In this section, a coach and horses with its passengers is making its way through Cornwall to Jamaica Inn. Jamaica Inn. It was a cold grey day in late November. The weather had changed overnight when a backing wind brought a granite sky and a mizzling rain with it. And although it was now only a little after two o'clock in the afternoon, the pallor of a winter evening seemed to have closed upon the hills, closing them in mist. It would be dark by four. The air was clammy cold and for all the tightly closed windows, it penetrated the interior of the coach. The leather seats felt damp to the hand and there must have been a small crack in the roof because now and again little drips of rain fell softly through, smudging the leather and leaving a dark blue stain like a splodge of ink. The wind came in gusts, at times shaking the coach as it travelled round the bend of the road and in the exposed places on the high ground it blew with such force that the whole body of the coach trembled and swayed, rocking between the high wheels like a drunken man. The driver, muffled in a great coat to his ears, bent almost double in his seat in a faint endeavour to gain shelter from his own shoulders, while the dispirited horses plodded suddenly to his command, too broken by the wind and the rain to feel the whip that now and again cracked above their heads while it swung between the numb fingers of the driver. The wheels of the coach creaked and groaned as they sank into the ruts on the road, and sometimes they flung up the soft spat of mud against the window where it mingled with the constant driving rain, and whatever view there might have been of the countryside was hopelessly obscured. The few passengers huddled together for warmth, exclaiming in unison when the coach sank into a heavier rut than usual, and one old fellow, who had kept up a constant complaint ever since he joined the coach at Truro, rose from his seat in a fury and, fumbling 
with the window sash, let the window down with a crash, bringing a shower of rain upon himself and his fellow passengers. He thrust his head out and shouted up to the driver, cursing him in a high petulant voice for a rogue and a murderer, and that they'd all be dead before they reached Bodmin if he persisted in driving at breakneck speed. They had no breath left in their bodies as it was, and he for one would never travel by coach again. Whether the driver heard him or not was uncertain. It seemed more likely than the stream of reproaches was carried away in the wind, for the old fellow, after waiting a moment, put up the window again, having thoroughly chilled the interior of the coach, and, settling himself once more in his corner, wrapped his blanket about his knees and muttered in his beard. His nearest neighbour, a jovial red-faced woman in a blue coat, sighed heavily in sympathy, and, with a wink to anyone who might be looking and a jerk of her head towards the old man, she remarked for at least the twentieth time that it was the dirtiest night she ever remembered, and she had known some, that it was proper old weather and no mistake in it for summer this time. And, burrowing into the depths of a large blanket, she brought out a great hunk of cake and plunged into it with strong white teeth. Mary Yellen sat in the opposite corner where the trickle of rain oozed through the crack in the roof. Sometimes a cold drip of moisture fell upon her shoulder, which she brushed away with impatient fingers. She sat with her chin cupped in her hands, her eyes fixed on the window, splashed with mud and rain, hoping with a sort of desperate interest that some ray of light would break the heavy blanket of sky. And but a momentary trace of that lost blue heaven that had mantled Helford yesterday shine for an instant as a forerunner of fortune. So there's your extract. And you can see the first thing that I have done is I've flicked through all the questions and I've just annotated up which section I need to use for each question. So question one is based on lines one to seven. Question two is based on lines eight down to 18. And question four is line 19 to the end. So I've got all those annotated up on my extract. So hopefully when I come to answer the questions, I won't get muddled up and write about the wrong bit. So that's quite an important thing for you to do when you're reading through the first time. The next thing that is a really good idea to do is to go through the reading section and get it annotated up as well. And these are the kind of things that you should be annotating. So in question one, list four things, that's already in bold, but you could highlight that from this part of the text about the weather in Cornwall. So it's just about the weather in Cornwall. And then you might want to jot down my top tips. So for question one, state the obvious. Do not infer, just write down obvious things. Start each statement with the weather or it to stay focused on the weather or it. And then always, although it says list four things here, always just do one for luck. It takes 30 seconds, probably less to do one for luck, and it just saves you in case you make a silly mistake on one of the others. And some of my smartest students have been known to make silly mistakes. There's no point in throwing away a mark. Let's have a look at annotating question two. So question two, look in detail at this extract from lines eight to 18. There shouldn't be any excuses because it's printed for you. I'm gonna highlight the question, how does the writer use language here? So that word language should remind you that we're using this technique here, point, evidence, analyze, or whatever mnemonic you use to remember how to analyze language. So for point, put it into context, evidence embed it if you can, and analyze, zoom in on the quotation and bits of language in the quotation. I've got sentence forms written here um, because that's what they suggest that you use. But actually what I really want to do to sentence forms is just to cross those out because no one ever said anything good about sentence form so just stick to the first two bullet points so what you can do is cross out sentence forms 
And then I've circled eight marks because that means I should spend eight minutes on it. So that's what I'd annotate, lines eight to 18, cross out sentence forms, highlight language and the effects of the weather because that's the focus of the question, circle eight marks, you know you've got eight minutes and write down PEA and what it stands for because that's the technique you're going to be using. This should take you seconds to annotate. Okay, so on to question three, which is annotating the source. I'm going to underline. Now you need to think about the whole of the source. Um, it says, the text is from the opening of novel. How's the writer structure the text to interest you as a reader? Don't answer. Uh, it doesn't interest me because you won't get any marks. And every year when I'm marking these exams, someone always plays a smart Alec and write down is not interesting. You've only fooled yourself there. All of these bullet points are really, really useful. And you can circle eight marks. Now there's two different techniques that you can use to remember what you need to do for question three. If you're really good at remembering and you've been revising very thoroughly, remember these bullet points from the structure questions. Whose views, who's telling the story? What time is it? Where am I? Who is here and what are the patterns? Are there any motifs? If you find that too difficult to remember or you're here the night before the exam and you haven't got time to learn that off by heart, then just remember the rule for paragraphing, tip top paragraphs. When does the time change? When does the person change? When does the topic change? And when does the place change? And then explain why those things change. What effect is the writer trying to create? I've circled eight. It's another eight mark, eight minute question. Okay, on to question four, and we're still annotating up. So on question four, we're looking at the second part of the source from lines 19 to the end. It's always about half and the second half of the article, but make sure you know what line it starts on. And then we've got the student statement here. A student said, the writer brings the very different characters to life. It's as if you're inside the coach with them. So highlight maybe in different colors or underline the two different parts of the statement, do you agree or disagree? And again, the three statements, um, the three bullet points to help you are really, really useful. It's 20 marks, so you're gonna spend a good old 20 minutes on this, it's like a little essay. And the technique we're going to use for this one, which you should annotate your paper up with is C's, S-E-I-Z-E, -E, which stands for statement, evidence, inference, zoom in and evaluate and that will tick off all the boxes on the mark scheme if you can craft your paragraphs like that. So when you're annotating the paper just write down C's and what that stands for. And then finally have a little peek at question five. I haven't put any annotation here but if you read the two questions write a description suggested by this picture. So a descriptive task or the story task, right, and the opening part of a story about a place that's severely affected by the weather. So those are your two choices. And once again, as I always suggest, you can combine those two. So if you want to do the story, but you want the setting in the picture, that is absolutely fine. Um, and remember, it's a creative writing competition, so it needs to be creative writing. You're writing a story. OK, so have a think about question five so that when you're working through questions one to four, you can start forming some ideas what you're going to write your story or your description about. Alternatively, we're going to do the exam in the right order, but you don't have to do the exam in the correct order. You can do it in any order you want. You might want to start off by writing your story and getting that done so that you know you've got time to do your creative writing. That's absolutely fine, but that's not what we're going to be working on in this video today. So let's go back to question one. There it is. OK, so question one is list four things from this part of the text about the weather in Cornwall. And we're looking at lines one to seven 
only we're not looking at the blurb and we're not looking past line seven so let's go back to the text <clears throat> and this is what it tells us it was a cold gray day in late november <clears throat> that could be statement one for you right there and you'll probably get a tick for cold if you copy down that statement next little bit the weather had changed overnight that could be your second bullet point the weather had changed or the weather had changed overnight that's about the weather write it down the next bit says a backing wind brought a granite sky and a mizzling rain with it okay so we've got some more information about the weather there a backing wind so that shows us it's windy um it brought a granite sky um, so that shows us a a dark grey sky and a mizzling rain. So you could just copy down that statement, a back in wind brought a granite sky and a mizzling rain with it. And you might get probably two ticks there, one for the wind and one for the rain. So if you've done everything I've said, you've probably got your four ticks already, but we'll keep on going. Although it was now only a little after two o'clock in the afternoon, that's nothing to do with the weather, is it? The pallor of a winter evening seemed to have closed upon the hills. Nothing to do with the weather there either. Cloaking them in mist. However, mist is about the weather. So you could write the weather is misty or mist cloaks the hills. Something like that would be absolutely fine. So now we've found at least five statements already. The air was clammy cold. So again, the weather is cold so you can write down the weather was clammy cold and for all the tightly closed windows it penetrated the interior of the coach so it's so cold it's getting inside the coach the leather seats felt damp nothing to do with the weather there must have been a crack in the roof nothing to do with the weather little drips of rain that's to do with the weather so if you haven't said already that it's raining you could add that bit on little drips of rain fell softly through smudging the leather and dark blue stain nothing to do with the weather so you can see potentially there's about seven or eight points about the weather just there. So pause the video and write down your statements for question one remembering to do one for luck okay then so on to question two now and we've got it all annotated up from when we did our first read through um, and we're going to be using pea for this one to explore how the writer uses language to describe the effects of the weather and the first thing that you are going to want to do is to have a look at this language and what i've done is i've broken it down using my highlighters into three different categories so everything that i have highlighted in green is where the writer uses personification to describe um, the weather and to describe the coach so the wind came in gusts at times shaking the coach as if it traveled around the um as it traveled around the bend of the road and in the exposed places on the high ground it blew with such force that the whole body of the coach trembled and swayed rocking between the high wheels like a drunken man so you can see there that the wind is kind of like aggressive and the coach it's like it's been beaten up by the wind and it's rocking and swaying like a drunken man. So it's almost describing the weather and the coach as a boxing match and the wind is the aggressor, the boxer who's actually winning there. Um, if we carry on, the driver muffled in a great coat to his ears, bent almost double in his seat. So here, this is like very much the effects of the weather. It is so cold and windy outside the drivers had to muffle up and it's again almost battering him so he's doubling up in his seat and a faint attempt to gain shelter from his own shoulders while the dispirited horses plodded sullenly to his command too broken by the wind and the rain to feel the whip that now and again cracked above their head while it swung between the numb fingers of the driver so you can see pink the effect of the weather on the driver blue the effect of the weather on the horses. 
Okay, so if we have a look at the effect of the weather on the horses, they're dispirited. That means they're really down in the dumps, so really feeling miserable emotions. I haven't highlighted plodded, but you could talk about this. Plodded sullenly um, to his command, um, because that's more about the effect of the driver, but it's as if the horses are sulking. The horses are too broken by the wind and the rain so it's like they've been beaten down into this dispiriting this really miserable mood and they're so broken by the winds that they can't feel the whip um, that the driver is um, whipping onto them so it's like the wind and the rain is more painful and more stinging than the whip itself okay so that gives you a sense of perspective there okay a sense of comparison that's being used back to the driver it's so cold and wet out there his fingers are numb he can't feel his fingers right and then we're back in the last little paragraph of this section to the idea of personification the wheels of the coach creaked and groaned so again it sounds like effort doesn't it the, the coach sounds almost like an old person as they sank into the ruts on the road and sometimes they flung up the soft spattered mud so it makes it sound like the coach is so beaten down that all it can do is chuck mud at its own windows um, where it mingled with the constant driving rain whatever view there might have been of the countryside was hopelessly obscured and again at the end that is the effects of the weather there but I focused on something else so if, um, when I'm doing my answer I'm going to focus on these three things and I'm looking at those three things and thinking this top one is really strong and probably the one about the horses and the whip, that's a really strong point too. So I might leave these ones to a last in case I run out of time. So that's exam technique, just picking out your strongest ones and doing those first. So what I've done for you is a little model paragraph, where it's actually it's quite a big model paragraph. Um, and this is how it goes. And I'll tell you what I've annotated in a minute. I'm just going to move myself down there. Through outlines. 8 to 18, the writer uses personification to describe the weather and its effects. She describes how the wind came in gusts, at times shaking the coach, which indicates the unpredictable nature of the wind, since it is gusty rather than consistently blowing. The wind's effect is to shake the coach, which makes the vehicle seem vulnerable. Indeed, Du Maurier goes on to describe the wind almost like a bully when it blew with such force that the whole body of the coach trembled and swayed, rocking between the high wheels like a drunken man. The verb trembled indicates that the coach is weak and fearful, whilst the verb swayed and rocking highlight again the coach's vulnerability to the effects of the weather. The simile, like a drunken man, creates the impression that the coach is the loser in a vicious boxing match and is punch drunk and about to drop, falling sideways unconscious. On a more literal level, if the effects of the weather was to drive the coach over, this would be extremely dangerous for the passengers inside. So if you have a look at what I've done, highlighted in yellow, is where I have used my terminology, my English language or English literature terminology. So here I've got personification, I've got verbs down here, and simile. You don't get stacks of marks for using terminology, but you can see how using the terminology just helps me write a nice fluent answer here. Um, the second thing that you can see that I've done is I've tried to use words to show analysis. So words to indicate really clearly to my examiner that I'm zooming in on the language. So here I've got indicates, indicates again, that was a bit casual, highlights and creates the impression. In eight minutes, I don't really have time to go back and change up my analytical words. If I was doing this more slowly and practicing, I'd probably try to think of some different ones. And then um, what I've got in the blue is where I've tried to link it back to the question to make sure that I stay focused. So how does the writer use language to show the effects of the weather, the wind's effect, vulnerability to the effects of the weather, the effect of the weather so i keep linking back to the focus of the question and then 
underlined in pink is where I've really zoomed in. So um, the unpredictable nature of the wind, gusty rather than consistently blowing. And the wind is like a bully. Uh, the coach is weak and fearful. The coach is vulnerable again. And this whole section down here about the book, so uh, being punched drunk, and that's all analysis as well. Um, if I was marking this answer, um, I would probably give it a six out of eight. If I was feeling generous, I might say it's a detailed answer. Um, I wouldn't say there's anything particularly perceptive about it. OK, I haven't done anything really, really clever, but I have been like a dog with a bone and I just keep really, really going back to the language and zooming in and zooming in some more. And that might make it detailed enough to get into the top band for this answer. OK, so it is a really good, solid paragraph. So your task is to time yourself for eight minutes and have a go at writing two more PEA paragraphs on two of the other quotations that we highlighted. And when you come back, we're gonna spend a bit of time thinking about question three. Okay, so here's question three then. You now need to think about the whole of the source. This text is from the opening of a novel. How has the writer structured the text that interests you as a reader? And what you could write about is what the writer focuses your attention on at the beginning, how and why the writer changes this focus as the source develops, and any other structural features that interest you. It's worth eight marks, so you should spend about eight minutes writing your answer but you've got a couple of minutes to do some annotation um, and that's what I'm going to go through with you right now. So if you have a look at the text again and this time I'm going to read through really really quickly. It was cold grey day, it's late November, the weather had changed overnight, um, it's granite sky, it's mizzling rain and so on. And what is being done here is the writer is establishing what the time, the time, the date, and the places are so really, really establishing the setting in this one and the time. Um, so the time is late November. So we know it's on that borderline between very late autumn and winter. In fact, the word winter is just here. It's only two o'clock in the afternoon, but it's getting dark already and it will be dark by four so we're jumping forwards in time thinking about what it's going to be like so you can see there what i'm talking about so it's establishing all of these things to help locate the reader um, and it's establishing that it's already quite dark and that creates quite a sinister foreboding mood and it's establishing that at the beginning we're outside the coach but then we move inside the coach and things don't get much better when we move inside. Then the writer takes us back outside again to the wind came in gusts, shaking the coach. And um, we can see um, almost as if the writer's making a film, the coach from the outside. And then the, the writer moves us from seeing the coach from the outside to seeing the driver. So the person is established now. So it's not really a change of person, but it's the introduction of a person, the driver himself, and the animals, the horses that are pulling the coach. What's the effect of that? Well, as we've just answered in question two, the effect of focusing on the person and the animals helps to really, really establish what the effect of this disgusting, filthy weather is. And um, we get more of the effect of that on the coach in this paragraph here. Um, then it's always worth having a look at question four to help you answer question three, because where they say start your answer to question four, like lines 19 and on here, there's normally a really, really big shift. And that's why they tell you to start there. And here we do get a really big shift because it takes us inside the coach and it focuses on all the people in the coach. Then it zooms in specifically on the grumpy man inside the coach. 
and the place changes as i said from in um, from inside to outside as a grumpy old man shouts out of the window and then also we get some reported speech in here so what the man's actually doing so that like the topic changes as well because he starts shouting these obscenities out of the window so we get loads and loads of big changes in this paragraph thinking about structure so loads of good things for you to write about there um, then down here we get a change of person it changes from the grumpy old man to the nice woman and we get some more reported speech so we kind of hear what the nice woman is saying and we see what the nice woman is doing there and then on the second page uh, we get um, a really interesting shift because we shift to another person structurally and this person's mary yellen and what you'll notice hopefully is that this person's actually given a name she's called mary yellen not just a first name surname too why do we focus on mary and why has the writer given her a name that's what you need to answer in your question and not just that instead of these kind of rather caricature characters here mary seems like more like a real person and the writer puts us inside mary's head this is called focalization and inside mary's head we start to understand what some of her thoughts and feelings are and inside her head we get this miniature flashback when she thinks back to earlier in the day or yesterday let's see when was it yesterday she thinks back to when the weather was lovely and she was full of hope but now the weather is disgusting and she's full of misery so we get a flashback and we get this really really big contrast between the beginning and the end so at the beginning we get this miserable weather which gives us a sense of foreboding like something bad is going to happen and at the end she's flashing back to one day ago the contrast of the good clear weather the blue sky when she was all full of hope um, and actually something that the jolly lady says a jovial lady says um it says no mistaking it for summer this time so it's almost as if overnight it's changed from a nice autumn day a summery autumn day the day before to a miserable winter day the seasons have changed um that's something that you might notice there so those are all the things that have changed and if you literally just go through the article um, through the extract and write down all the things that change without really saying much about them you can still get three marks out of eight on this question because it shows that you have an understanding of structure if you can go through and say a couple of quite quite uh, basic things about why it changes so um, the writer establishes a time and date to create a really miserable mood as if something bad is going to happen then you can get easily a four out of eight on this question you don't have to do much on this question to pick up some quite easy marks so don't be scared of it just go through plod through the article if you're feeling anxious and just say does a time change does a place change how does a place change and do that and then get used to building in what the effect of that is right so what i've done for you again is i've written a model beginning of an answer to question three um, so this is how i've done it um i've only written about the beginning you must write about the whole extract otherwise you will cap yourself as a, at a limited answer where you only get one or two marks if you only write about the first paragraph like i've done here the writer opens the extract by establishing the time of year november late autumn the time 2 p.m and the extreme weather conditions these elements create a dark and treacherous mood the darkness at 2 p.m which is worsening and the brutal weather hint at danger ahead the writer starts with the exterior conditions and then moves inside the coach where things aren't much better with the coach offering little protection from the cold damp and rain she then takes the reader back outside but changes focus onto the driver and the horses to show the effects of the weather on both the coach and those driving it next the writer so you can see you can just go chronologically through the answer um, I've set you a task for this one. Time yourself for eight minutes and write the rest of the answer.
Um, but before I send you off to do that, remember, describe and explain what changes and then say why that changes and what the effect is. And hopefully what you're noticing from my answer here is I haven't used any quotations. What I'm doing is just describing and explaining what happens, almost summarising what happens and linking it to the structure. And that's absolutely fine. You don't have to use quotations in question three. In fact, it can be better not to use quotations because then you are not tempted to analyze the language and you don't get any marks for analyzing the language in this question. So that's something you definitely don't want to do. So don't use quotations, just try to summarize, to describe and explain what is changing, okay? so. This is going to be the end of this video. Time yourself eight minutes, write the rest of the answer. And in my next video, we're going to be talking through how to approach question four and just doing a little bit of thinking about question five, the creative writing question as well. I'll see you next time. Bye bye.